Okay, we'll just wait a couple more minutes. I can see people are still coming in here. All right. How is everybody tonight on this Sunday? Huh. How many of you are already teaching with kids? Like you're already either virtual or in person. Yeah. Okay. So good. So this is great. It's great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the introductions and just welcome everybody to our um, cozy little event tonight. Um, my name is Jen Jones. I'm a literacy specialist in Raleigh, North Carolina. I've been an educator for 28 years, taught in three states, California, Florida, and North Carolina, and kind of did worked in, I was in the classroom for 16 years, and then literacy leadership roles for a good eight. And then now I have my own um, business where I make resources, literacy resources, and do professional development. Sorry, Jen, you froze there. Um, I just introduced myself and then did everybody hear my introduction? I heard that part. Okay. So all I had um, said there was. You're frozen again. Guys, bear with me. Would it be possible for, if you are just attending tonight, if you could turn your cameras off, please? That would really increase the bandwidth of this meeting. If everybody turn their video off, please. Mm. Okay, that works a lot better. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. So I'll just reintroduce myself. Misty, thank you. If you don't mind just turning your video off, that would be great. Um, just really helps improve the bandwidth of the meeting space. I introduced myself saying I was Jennifer Jones. I've been in education for 28 years and um, love being a teacher. And now I do staff development with schools and districts all over the country and create and make resources uh, in literacy and joined tonight by Jennifer Orr of iWords and Dr. Cole. Um, I think both of you all are in Canada. Is that correct? That is correct. correct. Yeah. Yep. That's so good. But the three of us thought it would be fun to collaborate together tonight and just bring some strategies for literacy um, and SEL strategies that would really help um, teachers right now because we just feel like this is a brand new school year with kind of a lot of new conditions we've never really encountered before and keeping set students at the heart heart of all of our sort of sharings tonight um really kind of what we wanted to get into your hands right away so i'll let jennifer and chris introduce themselves great sure i'll go first uh so i'm jen or another jen um, I am a former teacher of 25 years um, and a literacy specialist and a special education specialist. I worked um, both in early years and primary um, and then special education, sorry, uh, special education uh, as a consultant um, for the last 10 years uh, as well. I'm a researcher, so I develop evidence-based uh, resources around multisensory learning. Uh, and, this, and then Dr. Cole, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I've been in practice for some 35 years. I've done a variety of things um, from uh, occupational health in the military and in uh, the civilian world. 
I have a master's in public health. Um, I come from a family of educators, so I've always been keenly aware of, uh, as a physician, how much uh, education is so such a part of the whole thing. I've been involved in cosmetic medicine, um, and I've also, the last uh, decade or so, um, very involved with mental health, as I've seen uh, how mental health and the cosmetic and the mind and everything all come together, and how a lot of physical um, problems in our bodies are also kind of uh, related to our emotional wellness. So, um, so I'm, I'm really, um, I've been very interested in, in, in over the last decade uh, in doing more in the educational world and really seeing that mental health has to really happen at the, uh, the child level and, um, and move all the way up. Awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to tonight because I feel like we each bring a different perspective to kids and literacy and emotional needs. And Dr. Cole, I referred to you um, in one of my Instagram posts last week while you work in mental health and are an MD. I feel like when it comes to children, um, I was explaining to a, a five-year-old the other day about what I was doing tonight. And she said, um, well, what kind of a doctor is he? And I said, he's a feelings doctor. <laughs> and she said, oh, so yeah, I was like, that's a perfect way to tell to tell to kids, like, especially when you do have your own children who go a five, fives and six year olds who go, go to a psychiatrist or a psychi psychologist. It's like, what kind of a doctor is this? And so she got she got it right away. As soon as I said that, well, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to begin tonight. I have some slides. We each have slides prepared for you. And hopefully um, we're just going to kind of keep building on each other with Jennifer, Jennifer bringing the um, literacy research into it and Dr. Cole bringing the mental health research into it as well. So let me share my screen here, my PowerPoint slides. Um, I talked a few months, uh, excuse me, a few weeks ago about the importance that we're at a very critical moment right now with going back from virtual instruction after, for some of us, up to 15 months off um, and coming back into in-person instruction. And I also just really feel like Day to day, we tiptoe through wondering if we're going to stay in person. And so if we are going to start in person, we do really have this two, three, or maybe four week or cross our fingers all year long window to capture some, some data about our students. Um, I wrote a blog post about this a few weeks ago, but I feel like teachers did a, an amazing job last year teaching virtually and hybrid and all across the board, flipping every single day and meeting the demands of families and administration and laws and rules. Um, and the teaching I thought I think was outstanding, but there is a piece of, of learning that needs to be assessed. We don't know how much learning occurred when it comes to our students right now. So my proposal is that we we if we've never left um, universal screenings, I think, you know, RTI legislation went into effect in 2009. I think we have a unique opportunity when all our students are back in the building to do some type of universal screening and um, uh, AIMSWeb and excuse me, Dibbles and EZCBM are free um, online. You can download the per pencil dibbles um, at University of Oregon and EZCBM is also their sort of computer um, version of it. But I think we need to kind of get back to um, screen everybody, um, not just the lowest. And then we also, at some point too, we also um, pretty quickly thereafter need to do more diagnostic evaluations on the rest of our kids. Um, in my former county, we used to call it digging deeper assessments. Um, they are diagnostic in nature because it really pinpoints um, the reading strengths or difficulties or knowledge or skills before the instruction begins. So it really makes us make sure that the instruction that we are delivering is more higher bang for our buck. I like to think of digging deeper and diagnostic assessments as taking your car to the mechanic. You know, they hook it up to the computer and it tells them exactly where the problem is. So these um, assessments are what I would highly recommend at a minimum for K2, but three, five as well. In a, in a perfect world, we would expect all of our third graders coming to third grade knowing all their phonics patterns and um, how to decode and add a encode, but it isn't always the case. And so, but I wanted to provide you all with a folder of these free diagnostic assessments from me. So if you just want to jot down, or maybe I know Michelle has was said she would um, put notes in the chat box, but it's a bit.ly link and it's all um, under a lowercase. It's just free diagnostic assessments um, 
sort of all one word. And all of the diagnostic assessments that I just referred to on the last page are all linked there for you for free. They are the assessments, the directions and administration um, for um, giving them, and then also the sort of scoring matrix for each of them. And I think that will really yield that specific data that we're looking for about what our ch children learned especially last year or lost, um, especially when it comes to those important um, phonics skills they need to read. Um, also, this is something that would be, <laughs> I was I always talk about this as like sort of like self-actualized, like if you're a self-actualized school, if you're really at the top of the pyramid of, of, of providing um, expert urgent literacy instruction, then what I propose is what I call an instructional audit or an instructional a biopsy. It's where you um, go. You can feel you can complete this as a as a grade level. You can definitely um, do this as a as a teacher in your on your team. But it's more effective if you do it as a grade level or as an entire staff. So I noticed that there were some literacy coaches and principals in the room, and that's fantastic because this is this is um, most effective when it's done school wide and on a vertical continuum. So every grade level is doing this. But it is looking at the five areas of reading and then asking ourselves, okay, how, how is it being delivered? When is it being delivered? For how long? And with what uh, materials are we using in all five areas of reading plus in the area of writing? So this is also um, a document that, that I will share with you um, as a part of this. I'll try to link up some of the pieces like when my turn is over and drop them into the chat box. Um, I also believe that um, there's a lot of states moving towards legislation for the science of reading, and in that process, part of that legislation is getting teachers trained, and that's a very expensive training. It's about approximately, the letters training is probably approximately $1,800 per teacher, and I know in North Carolina, the science of reading just became legislation this summer, and there's like four waves, four years of phases to train all the teachers, and so... If you're in the third or fourth wave, that means those students are going to have to wait three or four years until you until you fill up your phonics knowledge bucket. And so I'm thinking that this is a great book. I read it this summer. I've, I've tabbed it. I, I refer to it quite regularly. I was a bachelor. I have a bachelor's degree in English. And I took I took a lot of courses in um, linguistics. But even, even this book was um, taught me some new things just about our language and the English language and some of the rules of English and the rules of phonics. And I think it will help you again now instead of later. I'm also suggesting that you also pick up this book too. And I know Jennifer is going to talk about sight words um, in her portion, but this is also a great book too, because it's written by the same author. Um, it's made me, let me just mute all. Um, it's written by the same author that wrote the um, uncovering the logic of English. And this book is written in 67, 67 phonics lessons that are all 10 minutes or less. And the phonics um, lessons really just go in like four or five steps like this, um, teaching students once they know um, single letter consonants and vowels, then it moves into like all the irregular patterns. And so really simple, quick, explicit, I think personally, and professionally, that this book right here, and this book is, oh, by the way, this book, Uncovering the Logic of English, is $13 on Amazon, and this book, Sounding Out Those Sight Words, is, I think, $18, and it's, I just think it's like a little treasure, um, kind of like a little hidden gem that would be um, great for Tier 1 instruction, but ideal for Tier 2 instruction. Um, I'm also a fan, as you know, of the secret stories. Um, they are not a scope and sequence for systematic phonics instruction. They, secret stories are not phonic skills. They are letter behaviors. Um, so frequently, um, letters do not do what they're supposed to do, like on the alphabet train. So like most classrooms or Pinterest classrooms or Instagram classrooms have an alphabet train going across the top, like A to Z. And so often letters do not actually make that sound on the alphabet train. So teaching students how letters behave when they get together with other, other letters is going to be critical. And the secret stories is fast. So you don't have to wait three years to deliver the keys to the code to students. You just, it's just, um, 
You just tell them when they need it. Like I always tell the story about how when the kindergartner is at calendar time and he's trying to read the word August and he doesn't know how to read August because he doesn't know the AU pattern yet. And I always jokingly say, well, are you going to be that teacher that says, well, I'm sorry, you can't read that word until the end of second grade when AU is at the second grade scope and sequence. No, you're going to give them the keys to the code now. Um, also, and I know that Jennifer is going to talk about this as well, but when it comes to our, um, we're rethinking how um, sight words and for high frequency words are actually, lots of them are mostly what I call codable, either decodable or encodable. So just the, what the, the, the protocol for teaching um, high frequency words that are mostly codable, where they have regular parts and some irregular parts, is that what we're going to do is we're going to teach that we're going to say the word and we're going to give it meaning, like what the word is, and then we're going to segment the word into sounds, and then we're going to spell the regular parts, but then we're going to teach the irregular parts. So, for example, um, on this word, this one word back here on the word about, right? So B is saying, but it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. OU is saying ow, like it's supposed to do. And T is saying t like it's supposed to do. It's just that that A is that schwa sound, that lazy sound. So we're going to teach students that part as irregular, but the rest of it is regular. Doing what it's supposed to do is what I like to say. Um, also, these fluency rings are a freebie that I'm going to be giving everybody tonight. These are truly, in my opinion, the, really the building blocks that kids need to be able to read um, and not memorize sight words. If they can just know um, letter names and sounds, they know blend sounds and secrets or phonograms. And so what I've done is I've created for you these, these little flashcards, really, where we're going to mimic decoding and mimic encoding. So when you mimic decoding, you show students the front of the card and you say um what sound does this letter make and they say S or what sound does this phonogram make and they say K or ow but to mimic encoding you you hold you hold the cards to your chest and you say write the letter that makes the sound K. write the letter that makes the sound qua so you mimic um encoding by asking them to produce the letters instead of the sounds so those will be all um linked up for you as well um, those are the blends. Those are the um, the secrets or in a generic word is just they're just phonograms. So that is also there as well. So you're going to be getting all of those. And then um, this prompt card, I have remade this prompt card so that we're prompting towards visual first so that when students get stuck on a word when they're reading we can prompt at the print level prompt at prompt prompt to look at the word or slide through each sound or try a different sound or break the word into parts um, and then once students have attempted a word and it's either it's incorrect or they don't know what to do then we're going to be prompting for um the questions like does that make sense or did that make sense or oftentimes if students make an error and keep reading we're not going to prompt at all we're just going to wait to give them an opportunity to fix it or realize later that they did not say say it correctly um or when child children do self-correct we are going to say you noticed something that didn't make sense here and you went back to correct it good readers do that so we're gonna be um prompting more upfront. I think I like to use the word steering. So we're like, like in this example over here of the text called packing up, we're going to be steering students towards reading um, the chunks that they've been taught um, first, and then recognizing those heart parts in there as well. Um, and then I also created for you a phonics grouping sheet. So unlike guided reading where you're grouping by level, um, when you have phonics focused groupings, um, you're grouping students by their phonics skill that they're um, that they've been taught. So I just really broke all the phonics skills on the continuum from most simple um, to complex at the end. So you would ideally um, write students names in each box and form your phonics groups based on what they need. And anything that a child, any any group that a child is in, so like any box, like if a child is in the consonant blends box, um, it's assumed that they can do and master everything in the boxes before their box. Um, then I wanted to also share with you the power of read alouds. Read alouds are 
um, one of the best ways for developing um, literacy and love of reading and sense of story and human empathy um, is through picture books. And this hashtag classroom book a day um, by Mrs. Heiss, she started a few few years ago. And it's basically simply a reading a picture book every day challenge. And it's a K-12 challenge. So it doesn't matter what grade you teach, um, reading a picture book every day to your students is just on what is part is is as simple as this is um i do recommend that this book i walk with vanessa is a great book to start off at the beginning of the year because it's a story about feelings and kindness and talking about feelings and i know dr cole's gonna be talking about the importance of actually talking and having conversations um of reading aloud to students that who cannot read can everybody hear me is that reading um allowed to students develops their listening comprehension until their decoding skills catch up and that's critical because you know they talk about how the one the one thing that makes a difference between um, students when they enter kindergarten is their vocabulary. And this is an analogy from um, Jim Trelease's book called the Read Aloud Handbook. That was a quote from the 70s, and it's still true today. So the more we read aloud to students, the more we are pouring into their listening vocabulary bucket. And if we read enough to them, and they are working on their listening vocabulary through all those listening skills through the read alouds. Hopefully that bucket will overflow. And if the listening vocabulary bucket overflows, it'll overflow into their speaking vocabulary bucket. So they'll be using more words when they're speaking in their expressive vocabulary to say words they mean. You can always tell when a student doesn't have a lot of vocabulary in their speaking vocabulary because they'll say things like, have you seen my thing that goes with my thing that I like to use when I'm doing that thing, <laughs> that means that students don't have a very expressive speaking vocabulary. Um, when we when do, do increase their speaking vocabulary, then it increases their reading vocabulary. And that is part of their receptive vocabulary, which means they know what words mean when they are reading words themselves. And if that bucket overfills, then it's going to pour into their writing vocabulary bucket, which means they're going to start being able to use these words in their own writing when they're beginning to express themselves in written expression. Um, I'm almost done with my part, but I just want to share a couple more strategies that will help build oral language in your class, which speaking and listening are four, two of the four areas of language. Um, morning meeting or class meeting, even afternoon meetings um, are a way to um, really get kids talking. Um, uh, research shows that if kids can speak within the first 15 minutes of class, they'll have a more successful day. And this protocol of greeting, sharing, activity, and message is from responsiveclassroom.org if you want to know more about um, classroom meetings. Also, when you're building your morning message to your students, um, this is an example of a teacher <laughs> from a class that I went to as a guest, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool too if we have in our morning message that we use different markers to sort of highlight some of those phonics patterns that we, we would have been teaching to our students in our morning message. And then this teacher on the left-hand side, she also does an afternoon meeting with her students and they share their glows and grows. And glows are things I'm proud of or things that are working well in, in our class and grows are things that would make our class work even better. And I like that idea so much to sort of end our day on a reflection. That same teacher also uses what's called a cubby collage, a cubby collage. And this is going to be, I think, really important this year, too, when kids are feeling um, being away from their home or caregiver for the last 15 months and now back at school, we might have some separation anxiety. And so these cubby collages are you send home a piece of construction paper to home and kids can cut out pictures of their family and their friends and their bedroom and the things that they like or also even just color color it in there or magazine clippings as well and then um, their cubby collage gets taped into the back of their cubby so when they're missing home they can go look at their collage that's like their own little um, picture because you know I have pictures on my desk of my family sitting on my teacher desk why can't students have pictures of their home in their little spot 
So I like that. Um, and that is, by the way, also shared with, by permission from little Esley June and her mom. So I wanted to clarify that. And then this is something I've used for a really long time. It's called the Peace Place. And it basically gives kids the language frame to say how they're feeling and um, let their voices heard. I always feel like when kids tattle, if they just were tattling because they wanted their voice heard. And so what better person to tell your tattle to than the person that's doing the bothering? And so this little frame work the red words are for the person that's being bothered and the green words are for the, the the botherer that gets to listen and sort of repeat back and so just of course these anchor charts to ask kids you know what is making you feel loved or special at school and letting kids um, create an anchor chart so that you know and they can express themselves and then of course this is my last slide it's called the calming corner corner and um, this is something that is going to make kids feel like there's a, they have a safe place to go. I know the teacher puts um, stuffies in there that she often washes at home and fidget poppers and a clipboard with paper and crayons so they could express themselves if they wanted to or draw a picture to take to send home to mom and dad whenever I had students that missed mom and dad and they wanted to go home or call mom. I would say mom's busy at work, but you can draw her a picture and give it to her when she picks you up today at carpool. And so we had um, of those things in the corner. So I'm going to unshare my slide. I hope some of those things were helpful. I'll try to read your questions and comments while um, um, Chris does his part. Um, Dr. Cole's going to go next and sort of piggyback off what I said. And Dr. Cole, I'll, I'll send it over to you. You're going to have to, Dr. Cole, you're going to have to unmute your mic and then also you can share your screen at the bottom. Perfect. And your mic is still muted too. Down at the bottom right here where it says slide is where you'll project it probably big. Okay. And then the lower. The bottom, You're fine. What am I doing? Bottom right. Wonder where it says apply to all. There's a box that says looks like a projection screen. You'll hit that box at the very bottom of your screen. Hmm. I'm not, not showing. Um... Keep going to the right. Oh, you're so close. <laughs> um, there's right. some icons under apply to all. Ah, that one. You got it. No, under apply to all. Oh, under apply to all. No. Under apply to all. There's a box. There's a little uh, television screen. There you go. Click that. Perfect. Is that going to put me on that right mode? Okay. So now I got to go back to the beginning. <laughs> all right. <laughs> there we go. Boom. All right. Great. Well, I've changed my introduction a little bit since we first talked, Jen, because things were looking fairly good uh, a month or two ago. And uh, so so kind of going back to school now, I was saying, unfortunately, this, the school year is looking like it's going to be a continuation of the uncertainty that uh, we've experienced since March of last year, at least for a little longer, um, with COVID variants now creating a fourth wave in North America and growing numbers of infections of younger people like in 20s and 30s and uh, perhaps children too. Um, we still don't know for sure what the school year is gonna look like, but um, we're hoping for a more normal in classroom uh, here this year. And uh, we have to be prepared though, I think to be maybe wearing masks again and perhaps uh, returning to virtual learning, but um, as we work our way to a new normal. Um, but upon returning to in-classroom learning, our young children may experience uh, a separation anxiety, as Jen said earlier, having spent so much time at home this last year and a half or so with parents and caregivers. Um, children are seeing and hearing frightening news on the television and perhaps from their families and, um, and adults in their vicinity. Um, and, um, and, and some family members may have gotten sick you know, and or died, or, or at least they may have known of people that have had that happen. So, uh, and their parents might also be facing worries about finances or job losses or coping with grief and, uh, and concern about whether they'll get enough uh, help from their uh, grandparents and others um, as the year progresses. So, uh, and I think of particular concern are those children from um, minority communities, such as those of color or low income, you know, who have been impacted uh, disproportionately. So what are some of the signs of, uh, of stress in children? So one might be uh, a change in mood. A talkative child might become uh, withdrawn or quiet. A calm child might become more irritable or cry with little provocation. 
be afraid to uh, be separated from their family or react overly emotionally to a situation. Um, kids might also react by feeling sick and they may actually get physical symptoms. So a, a child might experience headaches, upset stomach, uh, other discomforts or uneasiness. Um, you know, and they're not lying, they're, they're, uh, their symptoms are real. These somatic symptoms are real, um, but they're probably stress generated. And, uh, but the parents and the child children may not know that. Um, there may be also changes in our in behavior patterns. So there may be an alteration to a sleep routine, uh, less sleep can definitely impact um, their capacity to cope and learn at school. There could be changes in appetite where children you know, have no appetite and eat less or eat more. Um, they could also stop engaging with um, favorite play activities, sit motionless in front of a toy or a coloring book and, and not engage. Just often we don't experience as much pleasure when we're under stress from the things that we used to enjoy. There may be uh, trouble concentrating, completing schoolwork and some students may engage in disruptive behaviors such as bullying and things too. Um, also, avoidant behaviors might become apparent and a stressed child uh, might express a desire to stop engaging with people, activities, or, or environments that they associate with their negative feelings. They may not want to go to school or at least express that. It's common for kids to avoid talking about how they feel because they're also worried like the rest of us. They know that others might not understand or they might not agree, um, especially parents, and uh, they may feel... Um, they may fear being judged or considered weak uh, or scared or babyish. And uh, lately with the, you know, the, with the pandemic, kids' mental health issues are definitely on the rise. Um, recent studies by the CDC found that children's uh, emergency department visits have uh, increased significantly with regard to mental health related emergencies. Um, so this year, uh, the educational community um, of course, we'll be focused on strategies to mitigate learning loss that's occurred and that many children have suffered. Um, children, even those who were in physical classrooms last year uh, may not have experienced optimal learning environments during uh, the pandemic. And they might be, uh, and many may be significantly behind. In addition to these learning gaps, children's uh, mental health has worsened throughout this pandemic. Um, the impact uh, of uncertainty has made life uh, less predictable and uh, is resulting in significant stress, anxiety, and depression among children. Given the very difficult uh, or different academic challenges and emotional needs of each child uh, in returning to in-classroom learning, students will require more support than ever before. Educators uh, are asked to help learners uh, rebound ed academically while also supporting uh, their emotional needs. So I want you to know there is hope. Um, I think a lot of things, good things are gonna come out of this um, as we get through it, but um, I think we can build social emotional skills in our students to promote uh, their resilience and emotional well-being. And I think uh, you know, higher levels of emotional well-being do correlate strongly with higher levels of academic achievement, which means kids need to feel safe and secure in the classroom and they need to feel calm and connected and they need, uh, uh, and, and the, with a sense of belonging and purpose uh, to their day. So how do we build these skills? So social and emotional learning is the, the process of developing uh, self-awareness, self-control, and interpersonal skills. Uh, people with strong social emotional skills are better able to cope with everyday challenges and benefit academically, professionally, and socially. So SEL increases pro-social behaviors such as kindness, sharing and empathy, and it improves the students' uh, attitudes towards school, which is important. Uh, SEL reduces depression and stress among children through effective problem solving, um, some self-discipline and impulse control, and through improved management of their emotional states. So SEL provides a foundation for positive long-term effects uh, on kids, adults, uh, and their communities. This is just, a, I'm going to use this a bit later, a bit more, but this is sort of one of my CBT kind of guides that I use um, in terms of um, um, how it works. So if you look at the main triangle, we sort of have this above, there's the situation. So of course, we're all confronted with COVID and all of the things that are going on, but we have thoughts about those things. 
we have actions as a result and we have feelings it's kind of like a triangle and the arrows go all back and forth so it's all related and as a physician i've also added in the body to the model because as because you know stresses can cause bodily symptoms as well and um and then they feed back too for example uh, you know an adult might have a chest pain from anxiety and then they think they're having a heart attack um, and then of course the thoughts change to a heart attack and the emotions get worse more adrenaline's released and there's a whole cycle that gets out of control um, and, and so the same happens in children um, um, with probably a lot less awareness so we're going to come back to this but um, but I also want to point out that when our emotions get more excited and our body releases adrenaline um, there's that red line that cuts off thinking. So, so a lot of children then can't use their frontal cortex and their, their thought processes to engage. Um, and um, so we lose them in the classroom and, and they can't really engage and feel better. So we'll talk more about self-care and stuff uh, towards the end. But as I go through the SEL stuff here, I want to just kind of give you a baseline as to how it all fits together. So... Um, Let's start by, uh, with SEL by creating and maintaining perhaps daily routines. You know how we all benefit from routines and so, do, so will our students. Having classroom routines can be comforting, of course, even for us. Uh, even regular schoolwork can provide some sense of familiarity, safety and reassurance to the students. Uh, this could be, include a visual schedule of what the day will look like, like on the slide, um, and also reviewing verbally what's going to happen and uh, providing a visual countdown or visual countdown clocks so students can anticipate um, and prepare for when changes and activities will occur. The more we can make their days predictable, the more confident and relaxed the students will be. Engaging families uh, in the same way by providing information about what you're doing in the classroom and what they can expect early on this year will help the parents and the children prepare for your routines and uh, your expectations. Um, providing talk time um, and by creating structure around time to discuss uh, outside worldly or family events with students, uh, sharing their concerns in the classroom is important. This uh, talk time uh, might be given a special name. I think I heard you say cla class meeting, uh, Jen, and uh, it could be called a community circle or circle of friends. Um, it's a great time to talk about emotions too. Uh, I encourage people to try discussing uh, labeling and acknowledging uh, the children's emotions as you see on the, on the uh, example yellow document there you might incorporate uh, that a use of visual chart like that um, where there's some basic facial expressions labeled with emotions uh, it can be helpful for children as they learn how to talk about what they're feeling and we can emphasize that emotions um, that they are feeling whatever they are are valid that they're healthy and it's normal and it's, and it's good to, to share those with others. Um, Role-playing different scenarios with the children can, can also be helpful so they'll know how to respond when placed in an uncomfortable or unfamiliar situation. Um, teaching them how to put themselves in another's shoes to imagine what others may be thinking or feeling um, is also good. And that also helps to promote empathy and understanding uh, and allows uh, you as the adult to motivate to model uh, an appropriate response and assist them in um, uh, developing healthy, health, healthy coping skills. Um, story time, as Jen was saying, can also be a, a good model. Um, and uh, there are many appropriate read aloud opportunities that allow educators to explore SEL themes within the classroom. Um, and books can be used as a way to learn um, about themselves, uh, the children from a character's problems or uh, character's concerns um, or successes. Uh, they can often be used as a springboard for a conversation about something that children in the class may be experiencing through identifying with a story or a character in the story. So we're talking about the thoughts and feelings and behaviors of the characters in the book, we can create a less threatening uh, opportunity for children to discuss some things that are troubling them. Um, we want to promote mindfulness and by creating a special place in our classroom. And again, I think Jen, you mentioned this earlier, where kids can take a break when they're aware of their feelings of upset, uh, whether or sadness or anger, or, the, or just know they need to calm themselves. 
Um, maybe they just know they're not paying attention. They're not uh, absorbing anything. So this space should have, again, a peaceful, calming atmosphere. It might include journaling materials, calming images, and some books about peace and love and connection. Um, children, some children have worrisome thoughts oh, running through their yeah. head. Some, some, some children have uh, worrisome thoughts running through their heads in the background throughout the day. Uh, these often involve distorted thoughts and beliefs, um, and they're often based on incomplete information. And uh, by intentionally addressing these thoughts and beliefs um, that they may share, we can often help children find a more true, uh, realistic and balanced interpretation of what's happening in their world. Uh, so they may, be, uh, they may learn to achieve their own sense of, uh, of calm. Grounding is another great technique where we use the body. Um, uh, to redirect the uh, spiral of negative and anxious thoughts. So if you think of the CBT thing, it's like our, our heads, our thoughts are going up all over the place. We want to bring uh, people towards the present moment. And one of the things our body is super good at is bringing ourselves to the present moment, uh, what we're experiencing with our five senses. So um, when we start to think about something that's stressful, our emotions can take over and the fear and anxiety can build. Um, and then there's that release of cortisol, but more probably importantly, adrenaline. And the feelings then reinforce the fearful or anxious thoughts, and it kind of can again spiral out of control. So the release of adrenaline, though, it's an important adaptive mechanism of our of our you know ancestry that helped us to uh, to, to live. Um, but it's uh, you know have uh, the fight, flight, or freeze reaction, or sometimes collapse, so that we would play dead, and that was a response of our survival instincts. But but these are not helpful you know, in the classroom or in learning, and especially when they're, when they become chronic or long-term. So, um, so when we have that kind of uh, fight, flight, freeze reaction, it takes our frontal lobe again off, offline where we do our thinking and rationalizing, um, and it makes it unavailable to us. So uh, children are then, you know, very easily overwhelmed by their emotional discomfort, which they may also be experiencing again as physical symptoms. Uh, they could have increased heart rates, they could have facial flushing, they could have muscle tension, restless legs, or just use the bathroom, dry mouth, you know, and so on, which is all going to be very distracting for them. So uh, their attention turns inwards again towards themselves and their own uncomfortable sensations, which makes uh, them unavailable for learning and, uh, and participation. So one, of the, one idea here is to, uh, as a grounding technique, is to use the five, the five um, senses Starting with C, we could look, have the children look for five things that they could see or identify, either write them down or, or state them out loud as to what they see um, or what they feel. You know, maybe they can feel their, their seat below their bum, their feet on the floor, maybe their hand on the desk or a pencil or their shirt. Um, have them uh, identify three things they might hear in the classroom or even outside, whether it be vehicles or cars or people walking down the hallway or, um, and then smell and taste are a bit more difficult because there might be not much smell or taste going on at the moment, but we could also engage them in what are things they do like to smell or notice um, or, um, or, or things that they like to taste. Um, and another way to ground ourselves using the body is to, um, to focus. So it takes us away from our thoughts because now we start focusing on squeezing certain muscle groups so, and then releasing it. Um, and um, so we can ask them to lay or sit comfortably. Um, or, um, and then put, if you have some calming music, perhaps we put that on and then guide the children to squeeze and relax different muscle groups, perhaps starting at their, their feet and then their lower legs, and then their, you know, their pelvis or their back and their arms and work our way to the head. Um, and perhaps at the end of each um, group, we could uh, have them exhale with a slow um, breath. And um, again, it's kind of, as we spend a few minutes doing these kind of activities, it takes us out of our, our thoughts. It kind of breaks that cycle of thoughts and emotions and it creates some calmness. Um, focusing on the, the positive, or uh, which is a growth mindset or frame of mind. Uh, as the adult in the classroom, the students often take uh, their cues from our emotions and behaviors. So if we model focusing on a positive interpretation uh, or way of seeing things in our mind's eye, 
uh, they will begin to mirror us. So this will help students become more resilient uh, and reinforce that they can overcome difficult challenges. The positive growth mindset phrases that we could use with students that include things like, I can do hard things, or I believe in myself, um, which again can help them remain positive when, when uh, things get tricky. And if they're struggling with things or making mistakes, we can reframe it as like, I can't do this yet. So those that kind of idea. Um, let's see here. Nothing's moving here. What am I doing? There we go. Um, building a community. So within the classroom, which is a community, we want to make each child feel like an important member of the community. So in cognitive behavior therapy or CBT, our most important uh, psychological need is to feel a sense of connection and belonging. So our social interactions are incredibly important to experiencing a sense of safety and security, which calms our nervous system. So I think we should make it a goal to start each day with a personal connection with the children. Um, it doesn't have to be time consuming or elaborate, um, but it could be as simple as just giving a warm greeting as each child arrives in the morning or asking them a question, you know, or noticing something wonderful about themselves. And I really kind of like what you said earlier, Jen, about, you know, if, if the children speak in the first 50 minutes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. They're more likely to, to engage during the day. And that's probably a great way to start that off too, right? So this is a, uh, a very important topic, um, uh, looking after ourself. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of look at teachers as a very important, playing a very important role in society, uh, definitely educators, but also caregivers and setting the whole tone in the room. So there's, and there's a lot going on, you know, taking care of a, a whole classroom of kids. So, so, so first thing I want to say that, you know, um, I think teachers and staff have been overlooked a lot in this back to school conversation in these last, uh, you know, the unprecedented times. And it's really important, I think, to grow into our own self-awareness and get to know what our own needs are and what our own limitations are. Um, and, 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 then, and then create some boundaries over that. Um, but I want you to take a moment right now and just sort of consider your signs of stress that you experience. You know, you can imagine if we were just sitting still and maybe this is something we could do each day, take a few moments and uh, whether it's kind of in a meditation kind of a thing and just close our eyes and, and notice what, what emotions we're feeling. So if we think of that CBT model. So what are, and, and when I think of feelings, I often think they're a bit diffuse. So they might find that you've got some anxiety in your chest, but not really sure quite where it is. It doesn't really have kind of a stop and a start place. It might be in your shoulders or your back. And uh, sometimes we have sadness in our face and we just notice, you know, where's the anger and maybe it can go into limbs sometimes. But it's more of a diffuse thing when we talk about feelings. Um, the next thing we can do, again, thinking about the body part of the CBT model, is we can do a body scan. So again, we can sitting or standing or laying down, we can close our eyes and kind of give ourselves a CT scan, perhaps starting with our toes and coming upwards and trying to notice, you know, um, what's going on in different parts of our body? Is there tension? Is there pain? And all those kind of things. And then as we move up, we might find other headaches. Are there, is there, what's our energy like? Do we have an upset stomach, other muscle joint aches or pains, um, or shoulder? A lot of people carry it in their neck and shoulders or low back. Um, are we feeling short of breath? Is there a rapid heart rate? You know, is there sweating and dry mouth and all these kind of things? So these are all kind of signs of our stresses. And we can also check in with these things, you know, during the day, even when we just take a, take a moment uh, if we practice them. Um, just back to this idea again, um, I, what I want to focus on in this one, if we think of the thoughts uh, portion of it, um, then uh, we look at there's a thing called automatic thoughts. Um, and a lot of us, you know, they just kind of happen and they're probably based on our, a lot of our core beliefs and how we see the world. So they just kind of come. But, you know, but we want to challenge them. Are they accurate and are they helpful? And can we find some more balanced ones? So I think it's, it's important to kind of, and then one of the things we do to sort of uh, look at the automatic thoughts is, is to look at um, the common cognitive distortions or thinking errors. So just, just tell me if you, uh, or, or just think if you relate to any of these things. So uh, do any of you take things personally? You know, and when we do it, it doesn't feel good, but it's probably not correct. You know, 
Um, jumping to conclusions, such as maybe mind reading what another person's thinking or, or, or fortune telling, it's going to be a bad day for this reason or that reason. Um, polarizing, sort of seeing things as good or bad, black or white or all or nothing. Shooting ourselves or others like I should have done this or I should have done that or, or shouldn't have. And there can be a cast catastrophizing and minimizing. So we start to relate to some of these things. We can maybe catch ourselves with our thoughts and, uh, and, and change them a little bit. Um, and reconsider. So, and then the, the next part, which I think is important, is just to look now at the, the behavior part of it's another intervention place that we can uh, uh, engage, which is, you know, self care. So, like sleep is probably a really, really important one. And how much sleep are we getting? Um, and a lot of us don't get enough. Um, the 7.5 to 9 is what's what most people need, but of course, a lot of us don't get that. And that will impact uh, a lot of our thoughts and feelings and our body sensations through the day. Um, are we getting some exercise? So we're kind of encouraged three times a week, 30 minutes, but some people can get maybe five or 10 on a daily basis, whether it's a walk or this or that. So that's something else that we might want to look at in our life. Uh, and then preferably doing some an activity that you like, if you can. Um, I know I had to do a treadmill uh, for parts of last year and uh, it wasn't my favorite thing, but I managed to incorporate an audio book to do it so it wasn't so negative, but I often felt better after doing it. And diet, for some of us, I think eating um, often enough is important, but then often eating the kind of foods that make us feel good or that we feel good about uh, so is important too. And then social is number four, but social is huge. And a lot of us who are busy, uh, have busy lives, but then you add in COVID and all the, the lockdown and restrictions, and a lot of us haven't been getting enough um, adult time with peers and loved ones and, and things like that. So and I like to think of a social engagement as like, like almost like a date with somebody where you're going to, it could be the husband or a wife, um, a partner, but it should be, you know, an hour or two of like no phones and doing something special where you give each other attention, not just, yeah, we were in the house together today. That doesn't count. Um, and then I look at things like task completion, like is are the chores building up? Do we have a bunch of paperwork to take care of? That can add stresses to us. And sometimes getting those things done helps us feel better. Mastery is one of those things where we might be wanting to learn how to play the piano or dance or do things. We may not be good at it, but it may be something on our bucket list we want to kind of work towards. And so, so engaging in those kind of things um, are important. And then pleasurable activities. I mean, a lot of us, the things we used to enjoy, we may not enjoy as much, but when you actually try to engage in something, like watching a movie or this or that, you, you, you may find yourself enjoying it more than you thought you would. And often we can combine these activities, like going for a walk with a friend or having a meal. Again, COVID has created some, some difficulties with that and has probably lowered all of our resilience somewhat in this period. And then problem solving, maybe problem solving issues at work in our lives, um, but it might also be problem solving, how do I get some exercise and how do I change my sleep habits and, and some of those things too. So, um, so th there's some really good um, ways to think about things. So, you know, I, I, wa I wanna, you know, a more healthy and balanced teacher is, is gonna be uh, a person who's enjoying their job, engaging better with the kids and uh, experiencing more satisfaction throughout our, our day. And that's so important. Um, so having a strong emotional foundation correlates uh, to academic achievement, uh, addressing mental health creates uh, an environment where the learner uh, student is ready and available for academic learning. So even during the uncertain and rapidly changing phase of education that's accompanied the pandemic, I re Okay. All right, we are in business. I have your presentation pulled up and I'm just going to share my screen now and let me get back to the Zoom. Let me share my screen. It's here. And back to there. Okay, Jen, there you go. Great, perfect. Thanks so much. You guys can hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to share with you a little bit about how um, iWords fits into the model of literacy and SEL, this very different back to school year. 
And um, if you don't know, iWords is an educational company. And what we do is develop evidence-based, multi-sensory resources, all backed by scientific research out of Stanford University. So throughout the pandemic, many of our resources have been a staple for educators, both remote uh, and in person, as well as for families. And a big reason for this is because the iWords method and resources are designed to uh, both accelerate developing literacy skills and also close reading gaps, um, while at the same time building confidence, increasing engagement, and um, developing those social connections um, like the ones Dr. Cole was talking about. We can change the slide, Jen. So why is multi-sensory reading uh, instruction so impactful? Multi-sensory learning plays to children's natural strengths and helps them to self-regulate while they are learning. So when material is presented in a way that engages multiple senses, the information becomes richer and those learning it uh, become more motivated to participate really actively in the learning. And multi-sensory lessons are really impactful for all learners, but are particularly helpful for those with learning challenges or self-regulation and attention issues. Uh, and Jen mentioned earlier those, you know, sort of uh, tier two and even tier three students that um, we might be, you know, sort of dealing more with more of this, uh, this school year, um, because we know that the pandemic has taken an emotional toll on our students, um, and that this has really impacted their ability to be alert, to be engaged, um, and to be attentive for learning. So, Jen, you want to put that slide? Thanks. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, so neuroscience confirms that uh, brain neurons that fire together wire together. So when we teach using multiple senses simultaneously, neurons in the brain actually fire at the same time and then wire together to create uh, neural networks. And these networks naturally integrate information uh, in order to form a clear mental picture as well as allow the brain to store and retrieve information more efficiently than with unisensory learning, just like that sort of diagram um, demonstrates. Uh, and this law is known as Hebb's rule after the scientist Donald Hebb. You can switch it, Jen. Great, so um, what does cognitive neuroscience have to do with iWords? Well, iWords is a multi-sensory way of teaching the high-frequency words. It combines an embedded contextual picture, related kinesthetic action, and meaningful auditory phrase with phonics in order to accelerate sight-read wording of uh, the high-frequency words. And in addition to that, iWords incorporates play-based activities to provide really fun opportunities for learners to solidify that learning while also building, again, those social connections. So when this sort of five-part process is used together, um, it leads to significant uh, improved reading outcomes. Um, so where does iWords fit into the mechanisms of reading, really that sort of science of reading um, piece that people are going to be asking about. And you may have seen this reading rope uh, or some simplified version of this in your own professional learning. So I'm going to briefly try and outline how iWords addresses those yellow sort of highlighted uh, reading systems on the diagram. Uh, so we know that many high frequency words are tricky to decode because they don't follow regular patterns of phonics. Words like the, was, uh, is, are, to, are, are a few examples. Um, in addition, most high frequency words are actually abstract, meaning that they have a little meaning on their own, but they contribute a really great deal to the meaning of a sentence. So sight word recognition of the high frequency words um, is really a foundational skill and a key stage to early literacy development. And as this diagram demonstrates, the stages are re of reading are really multifaceted. You can see that word identification, sight words, phonics, and vocabulary are key elements for core reading systems. Um, and additionally, when you look at mental systems uh, like attention, perception, and me uh, memory, 
Those are also key elements. So that, that yellow highlighted area shows how iWords addresses all of these foundational elements of the core reading systems to sort of uh, effectively move learners along that developmental reading continuum towards reading proficiency. So can we be sure that iWords really works? Um, and a team of researchers from Stanford University conducted a formal study examining the efficacy of iWords, uh, multi-sensory sight words and teaching method. Um, and here on this sort of a uh, diagram, you can see the results of the study. So the data clearly demonstrates that the iWord method of multi-sensory learning combined with phonics represented by that uh, green data plot outperformed the plain text word instruction with phonics represented by the purple data plot. So uh, data was collected at five different testing points over a span of 18 days so that you could see you know, how much retention students had um, over that period. And the iWords condition group received instruction with multi-sensory cues, but, and this is really important, were tested at all the data points on plain text words. Um, so the results clearly show that the students grouped in the iWords condition were able to transfer knowledge of words with the multi-sensory cues to plain text and then learned and retained more words than the plain text condition. So both conditions um, employed phonics instruction but iWords um, really outperformed phonics alone. Uh, and if you wanna read the full study, it's published in the peer reviewed journal, Learning and Instruction, uh, volume 65. And it's also linked on our website um, and in our IG page. Um, so how were the high frequency words chosen? Um, as educators, we know that all written material consists of a high proportion of common words that we refer to as high frequency words, or we sometimes call them sight words. Um, researchers have determined that the 100 most common words make up approximately half of all the material we, we read, half of all the material we read. So the top, learning the top 100 high frequency words be gives beginning readers access to 50% half of any text, whether a children's book or a newspaper article. So, you know, you may be wondering, well, how did iWords come up with their word lists? Um, and while all high frequency word lists vary from source to source, there are typically um, taken from one of three top, ten, top word lists. And your school district may be using one of these lists, the Dolch list, the Fry Instant word list, or Fountas and Pinnell word list. Um, and the top 100 words from each of these three lists, when compared, comprise a total of a, 150 unique words, with the majority appearing on all three lists. So if, you know, if we take 150 words, um, 150 of their words, that will cover all 100 of each of the three word lists. So iWords sets one to three, words one to 150 encompass the first 100 words, from all three of those main word lists. And Jay, I'm just gonna ask you to press play. Okay. Perfect, thanks. Um, and I wanted to show you, will play, maybe not. I wanted to show you how iWords fits into the active model of reading that supports self-regulation through motivation, engagement, and exec executive function, while also building critical sort of key sight word recognition and phonics skills. And you can see how iWords might fit into your own programming. Um, iWords is right now being used globally in over 60 countries um, around the world to support reading outcomes. Okay, let me advance. A one yeah. Oh, go ahead. Just that arrow on the bottom. Yeah, there you go. One final note um, is that during sort of this uncertain and rapidly changing uh, face of education, uh, iWords, digital materials and lessons are easily transferable to the online classroom. So I know last year um, teachers were able to move from, you know, in person to um, remote teaching uh, without sort of interruption to those lessons. 
um, and and that that same uh, um, without having to stop teaching I words because there was a continuum that they could they could flip easily to digital. Um, so for more information around you know any any uh, of the research, I would just recommend visiting iwords.com um, or reaching out, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, and Jen. That's sort of where I'm at. Oh, you're welcome. And Jennifer does have an Instagram account called, um, um, at, uh, you know, at, at, I at, I words, at I words learning. Yeah. So, so good. Yeah. yeah. So good. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I know we went over because of our snafu. It's 815. So I apologize for keeping you 15 minutes older over. But um, if there's anybody that has any questions, I'll, I'll stick around um, and be the last one to close the Zoom. If anybody wants to ask a question, I know if and Jen and Chris want to stick around as well, we can answer any sure, questions. Yeah. But um, I dropped the resources that I provided in the, the chat box already if you are on a desktop or a laptop. But since I, we do have all of your email addresses, we will email everything in one nice, neat um, chunk. I don't know if you, um, Chris or Jennifer, if you have anything to give everybody or just to get whatever, we'll put it in there. Um, but does anybody... If, you, if you'd like to sign off, we'd totally understand. We want to thank you for your time tonight, but we will uh, stick around for a few questions. Thanks, everyone. This was extremely great information. Thank you. Jennifer, somebody asked, Sarah asked if the student tracking page was available, if they have bought the cards already. So the student tracking pages are now currently available. Um, if you visit iwords.com and go to our digital resources, um, they're available there. Okay, perfect. Um, they are all ask, also asking if there's any discount codes for tonight to purchase the iWords. Uh, so we will, uh, I can actually put a discount code up on the website. So if you want to um, enter, uh, let's say, uh, Jen Jones, can we do that? Yeah. Uh, as the discount code. Uh, so if you enter Jen Jones as a discount code, we'll give you 15% uh, off all resources. Okay, 15% off. Okay, perfect. Okay, yep, yep. So good. Okay, great. I know, it never hurts to ask. That was so good. That's great. All right, well. Yeah, we watch the recording after, like since I actually made the mistake, I thought it was, um, I didn't realize it was Eastern time, so I logged on now. <laughs> Um, so if, there was a, if there was a way to watch the Zoom later on. Yep. So what we're going to do is we did record this and there was lots of people who also said they wouldn't be able to watch it um, uh, in real time. And so we're just going to, um, I'm going to upload, I'm, I'm going to give Jennifer and Chris the, the recordings as well, but I will upload it to my Vimeo channel, which is um, V-I-M-E-O dot com forward slash hello literacy i'm not i'm not fancy like youtube but i do have a vimeo channel and that's where it will be um probably tomorrow I'll, I'll upload it to that website and you can watch it and then i'll link the resources in there as well in the captions of the vimeo awesome thank you you're welcome so sorry about that all right everyone any other questions any other comments i have a yes, question go ahead. All right, Sarah, go ahead. Oh, okay. uh, Sarah, I don't know why, but we can't hear you, Sarah. <laughs> oh no. Did anybody, did everybody hear what Sarah said? I didn't hear it. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's I like, I heard you say, then. I have a question. Okay. My name is Pam. Um, I was wondering, um, for Dr. Cole, is, is there something I can do as a teacher? I have a student that's only been to school one day out of three so far. Mm -hmm. And I know it's got to be anxiety. Um, he has 
a learning disability, um, dyslexia, he struggles in that kind of area. Um, and his parents don't necessarily recognize that. Is there something else I can do for him? So how many days of school have you had so far? Three. Three. Well, he's only been to one. He well, I guess the first day. So have you had any conversation with, I guess, the parents as to um, what's going on? And this, this is a new student for you. Like, do you know him at all from before? or is this... Yeah, I know him very well. He um, had this behavior last year, too. Okay. So very predictable. In terms of like spending one or, one or three days kind of a thing at school? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I, yes, he was missing school last year. I can't even remember what the count was, but it was considerable wow. amount of days lost. And so the education being lost too, which is. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, you know, there might be, there might be some therapy that's required there, both for the family and the, and the, and the, and the child, but obviously, um, obviously you seem to know the child well. Do you relate well with each other? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm, the, I'm a resource teacher. So I followed him from first grade, second grade, third grade. Now he just ended and I have a good relationship with his parents. So I can be very honest, but one thing that I, I heard, and, and it's kind of a, I don't know, tongue in cheek kind of thing was asking how many times he was sick during the summer because he probably wasn't. <laughs> Right. You're right. It's probably anxiety. It's probably multifactorial and it probably require a, a team of the family and the child and whatever's going on. And obviously if you, there's a good relationship with you, I mean, that's the connection piece, right? That's so important. Um, but it, it doesn't work all by itself though. You know, all you, all you can do is the best you can do. Um, yeah. Are there any other resources for this child in terms of you know, um, um, well, is there a family therapist? Uh, I don't, I don't know as if they've ever taken advantage of that, but it might be the next thing I might um, suggest just because. Yeah, I, think, I think to nip these things in the bud as, as quickly as you can before patterns become too established is, is the best um, if they can. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. Thank I you. Pam, if I can. I wonder if I can just add to that, Dr. Cole, um, yeah. just based on my, my uh, experience as a, as a spec ed consultant. Um, I don't know, Pam, if it's possible for you to reduce expectation in terms of the, the time that he has to uh, show up at school. So, you know, what we would often do is reduce expectations. So maybe initially he only has to come for an hour a day. Um, and if we see some success with that, then we would extend his day slowly until we get him um, or, or her into school, and no, I guess it's a him, into school for longer points uh, or periods of the day um, with a gradual sort of increase as he uh, demonstrates success. And, and also during that one hour period, maybe reduce expectation um, by having him engage in activities that he is either very successful at or enjoys um, so that when he arrives at school, uh, he knows that he's coming into an environment and an activity that he's going to uh, want to participate in. Um, I know that it may seem like we are, you know, reducing expectation and, and changing demand for him. Uh, and, and that might for some have an, a, a very, you know, kind of leave a, a, an uncomfortable taste in their mouth. But typically that what we do is reduce expectation so that the child can feel successful and calm and comfortable. And then very gradually start to um, add more demand to their day once we have uh, seen some success and then build on that success. Even, I mean, even he's in fourth grade, so he's 10 years old. I mean, it's, it's not like this is a new, would you recommend something like that too? Yeah, I absolutely do that for, for <laughs> those kids on, um, in my spec ed, uh, in my spec ed sort of portfolio um, and for those kids who are experiencing high levels of anxiety, even if they're in older grades, um, because it's, it's not because they're not familiar with school, it's because they're anxious about coming to school for whatever reason. So we need to make that experience um, very, very, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to make them want to be there initially and then slowly and gradually fade the, the supports that we provide. But initially providing 
those supports, whether that be coming into a preferred activity um, or using sort of a first then, um, you know, first this uh, compliance activity and then a preferred activity so that they know what's coming. Um, that, that it's really actually very common to do with, with those tier and two, sorry, tier two and tier three students, regardless of. Yeah, well, I want to always, I was just add as well, just in to um, possibly recommend just a, just a regular visit to the regular pediatrician, because then you can start to sort of get these, this sort of patterns documented. So that if, cause like, I know my daughter, for example, she had anxiety and cried at the beginning of every school year, every year from preschool to middle school. Um, and we just kind of always took her to the pediatrician at the beginning of the year. And he kind of tried to talk to her and, you know, tell her, you know, this is your job and you need to go and it's okay to feel the way you're feeling and go. So it was like validating how she felt, but also saying, like you have to do it too. Um, but he kind of noticed a pattern of behavior every September, you know, she was making a visit and an, an unregular visit to the pediatrician every, um, every September. And then she did actually end up um, going on Paxil for anxiety in, in middle school, because it was just mm -hmm. too much to bear. Mm -hmm. um, like she was literally crying for like, two weeks straight. And I'm not I'm not, but I'm not exaggerating. Like she was just like beside mm -hmm. herself. Um, and that seemed to help at least. And her sister was even at the campus that she was at, but I think that would be like the first, if you can, if you can say that or recommend that, um, sometimes it doesn't occur to parents to take their children to the pediatrician for mental, um, um, you know, po possibilities. Sure. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. All right. Anyone else? before we hang up. Leslie, how are you? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm so good. Looking forward to the school year. I'm a little nervous. I'm doing a new thing. I <gasps> to um, English as a second language. So, whoop. Oh gosh. Well, good yeah. for you. Well, thank you for being here. I know a lot of teachers like like Dr. Cole said are just really, a lot of the strategies he shared work for adults as well. And keep us kind of like, we need to kind of stick, keep grounded as well, because there's just a lot, there's a lot of stress right now. There's a lot of la layers, layers in education right now. Um, so good for you. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for giving us some good advice. It really, it is hitting the nail on the head and we appreciate your time so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting now and everybody have a wonderful Sunday night. And remember that many of the things that we shared with you can implement in your classroom tomorrow. All right, everybody. Okay. Good night. Thanks, happy school year. Woo -woo. <laughs> <laughs>